book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 18, Matthew chapter 18, and I'm going to read from verse uh, 23, Matthew chapter 18, verse 23. If you don't have a Bible on you, then the scripture will be on the screen behind me. You can follow there. Jesus is speaking. He's telling a parable, and he starts off by saying, therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants, and when he had begun to settle accounts, he was bought, one was bought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. Now, this is a parable. It's a story. It's not a real king. It's not a real servant. Jesus is using this to illustrate a point. And so everything that he's saying is deliberate. It's not accidental. So this figure, 10,000 talents, is used deliberately to make a point. And the point is this. In that day, the number 10,000 was huge. It's not that big now, but back then, if you wanted to throw out a huge number, then you would use the number 10,000. It was used to like boggle your brain with the ginormousness of that. My family, we use the word kajillion if we're going to use a big, big number. And the talent was the largest weight that they would use when they were weighing out gold, silver, or, or bronze. And so the illustration here is this huge amount. And he was not able to pay. His master was commanded that he be sold with his wife and his children and all that he had, and that payment be made. Again, giving an illustration of the enormity of this debt. Normally, if you couldn't pay your debt, then they would take you. But this is so big, the king's like, I, you, your, your wife, and your lineage. I'm taking your children, therefore your grandchildren, everything that's going to come, and everything that, that, that you have. To give you an understanding on how big that debt was, a, a talent uh, was equivalent to about 20 years salary for the average worker back then. So this guy is 200,000 years in debt. Just made you feel a lot better about your credit card bill right now. So the servant... Therefore fell down before him, saying, Master, have patience with me, and I'll pay you all. The master of the servant was moved with compassion, released him and forgave him the debt. But that servant went out and found him one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. Now, a denarii was equivalent to about a day's salary. So this guy is owed about a third of a year of salary by somebody else. Let's call that. $20,000. So it's not like chump change. If somebody owed you 20 grand, it's not like, it's like not nothing. But in comparison, this is quite small. He laid hands on him, took him by the throat saying, pay me what you owe. His fellow servant fell down at his feet and begged him saying, have patience with me and I will pay you all. And he would not. But he went and threw him into prison until he should pay the debt. There are two players, main players in this parable. There is the king, there is the servant. Let's call the king the cajillionaire who is owed so much money by his servant that it's an unpayable debt. He has the mind and he has the money. He has the resources and the resolve to pay the debt and so he cuts the check and says, we're done here. He moves in compassion. He moves in mercy. Then you've got the servant who has an overwhelming amount of debt, an unpayable debt, and he says, please just have patience, and, and I'll pay it off. And the king wipes out the debt. He immediately goes out and finds somebody who owes him a, a fraction, just a microscopic amount, and when asked to do the exact same thing, have patience with me and I'll pay it off, will not do that, and then throws him in to jail. He doesn't have the money or the mindset, doesn't have the resources or the resolve to do anything about it. And, and so you have these two totally different men. If you could take the name king and servant, let's call him Kajillionaire and miser out and throw your name in there. If, if Jesus is talking about you, out of those two people, which one would you want to be? I, I know for me, I'd want to be the king. I'd want to be 
the kajillionaire. I think most of us deep down inside would say, yeah, I would like to be that person too. And so I want to talk a little bit about that this morning. I want to talk about how to develop that kajillionaire mindset. Before we get into that, let's just pray. Let's ask God to speak to us today. Ask the Holy Spirit to minister to us. Father, we just thank you for who you are. We thank you that you're here this morning. We thank you for your word. We thank you that your word never returns void. You always have an agenda. And I thank you that you have a plan. You have an agenda for this service. God, it may be slightly different than the last one as you tailor make this for the men and women that have showed up here this morning, those that are watching online. Your word declares that you are a rewarder of those who diligently seek you. And these people could have been doing anything else this morning, but they decided to be in your house. And so I pray, God, that you would reward them openly. Let them leave better than when they came in. Those that need healing, let them be healed. Those that need strength, let them receive strength. Those that need hope, let them receive hope. Those that need a new beginning, let them receive a new beginning. Do miracles here. Do something cool here today. And more than anything, God, I pray, oh Jesus, please help me not to be boring. And God, I pray for the men and women that are here this morning, please God, help them not to be boring either because that's always really, really horrible in Jesus' name. And everyone said, how many of you show of hands have ever been asked a question that you were a little nervous to answer because you felt like it was loaded, like it had an agenda behind it? Anybody ever been asked a question with an agenda? Uh, my, my daughter will do that every now and then. She'll just text me, Dad, will you do me a favor? Smiley face. And that's it. That's all the information I've got. And I'm nervous to answer because I don't know what the favor is, you know. I'm not sure what's behind that. Now, my wife is the queen of the question with the agenda. It'll be late at night. Lights are out. Crawl into bed. I will stare at her gorgeous face and she'll look back at this and... She'll say with a soft, gentle, beautiful voice, babe, were you thinking about going upstairs and getting yourself a drink? And I'll be like, no, I wasn't really. Why? And she'll be like, well, I just thought while you're up there, maybe you could get me a drink. You know, I'm talking about a question with an agenda. In Matthew chapter 18, there are two questions and they both have an agenda. The first one kicks off the chapter and gives the context to everything that's about to be said. The disciples come to Jesus, and this is their question. Jesus, in your kingdom, who's going to have the authority? In your kingdom, who's going to be in control? In your kingdom, who's going to be at your right hand or your left hand? That's the spirit of the question that they're asking. Now, when they ask about kingdom, their concept of kingdom is different than yours and my understanding of kingdom because they're from two different vantage points. For them, they have no crucifixion, they have no resurrection, they have no ascension, they have no baptism of the Holy Spirit, they have no birthing of the church. So in their mind, when Messiah will come, he'll create a political revolution. They'll overthrow the Roman government and Messiah will rule and reign on planet earth. And so they believe Jesus to be that Messiah. So what they're asking is, Jesus, when it all goes down and you take control, obviously you're going to need some roll buddies. You're going to need some wingmen. You're going to need like a vice Messiah. You're going to need like a deputy of salvation, maybe an ambassador of holiness. You're going to need some guys that are going to look after things with you and for you And we sort of want to know, how how do we get that authority? So the context is how do we have kingdom authority? How do we have kingdom power? How, How do we rule and reign in kingdom dynamics? And so with this question in mind, Jesus grabs a little child and brings the child and sits the child in the middle of them. Now, people have often preached these next few verses on how you and I should look after children, and I guess in a way you can take it 
like that, but the child is not the subject. The child is the illustration. And Jesus is using the child to make a point on kingdom authority. And in verse three, Jesus just starts dropping bombs. He says, if you want kingdom authority, you need to repent and you need to come into the kingdom like this little child. Verse four, he says, you need to humble yourself as this little child and that's how you get greatness. In verse five, he says, how you treat others is a direct representation of how you treat him. In verse six, he says, if you take advantage of people when they come in with this humility as a child, then you are gonna be in deep yogurt. Verse seven to nine, he says, you need to be aware of offenses and try not to offend or hurt anybody else. In other words, children, please play nicely. Verse 10 to 11, he says, don't treat each other arrogantly. In verse 12 to 14, he says, lost people matter to God. If one goes away, I'll leave the 99, I'll chase after the one. Everybody in the kingdom has value. And in verse 15, he says, but if your brother does sin against you, if you do get hurt, if you do get wounded, if you do get offended, somehow somebody pains you. He says, you have a responsibility if you wanna operate in kingdom authority to do your best to reconcile that situation. You need to take authority over your own hurt. He says, you need to go and talk to that person. Don't, don't build a wall, but build a bridge. Try, try, try to get it right. Try to find out what was really happening there. He says, if that does not work, then you need to get somebody else to go with you and have another shot. He says, if that does not work, then you need to get the church involved and, have an, and then have another go. And at the end of all of you trying, if you still can't reconcile, then break relationship, but not before you've had a shot at reconciling the brokenness. Bible says in, in, in other passages, as far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. Now, it doesn't mean that you're gonna get on with everybody. It doesn't mean everyone's gonna be, you know, hanging out together. But it says, as far as it depends on you, if it's up to you, then you use kingdom authority to reconcile all offenses, all disappointments, all hurt. All, you, you gotta take authority over that. He's saying to you, don't be passive aggressive and then just leave. See, our churches are weak because people get offended and rather than confronting the offense or trying to heal the offense, they just say, God told me to leave and I'm out of here. And we, just, we, think we're being, we think we're being spiritual by saying, God told me to leave. No, being spiritual is saying, God told me I need to get this thing right with you. That's how you have kingdom authority. It's not by running, it's not by hiding, it's not by denying, it's not by... I'm gonna be honest with you. If there ever was a generation that needed to hear about how to overcome offenses, it's us. We're probably the most easily offendable, politically correct generation ever on planet Earth. You know how easily offendable we are? I made that comment in Canada not that long ago. And a young man came up to the pastor at the end of the service and pastor, I was really offended today when he said that we're the most easily offendable generation. I was like, sir, you've just become an illustration. <laughs> it's terrifying to be a preacher. I probably offended you already and I haven't even tried. It's terrifying. I gotta watch what I say. In Chicago, so politically correct, that if I do a foreign accent in my message, in a story or a joke, they edit that bit out of the podcast so as not to offend anybody because I did a foreign accent. I'm an Australian, if you haven't noticed. I live in America. There probably is not a week that goes by that someone doesn't come up to me and try to do an Australian accent. They come up, hey, good day, mate, how you going? Chuck another shrimp on the barbie. You know, it's probably not a week that that doesn't happen. And not once 
in the 16 years I've lived here, have I ever responded with, are you trying to sound like me? No. I've responded with, (laughs) because that's the correct response. People want to be culturally relevant, and so they take me at Outback Steakhouse, which has no Australian food in it whatsoever. I've offended by people by stuff I've said. I've offended people by stuff I didn't even say. I had this girl get angry at me because she said, I said that Peter denied Jesus like a little girl. Wrote me this huge email and with, with articles on fight like a girl and girls are real people too. And, and so I, I wrote back to her and said, yeah, I'm sorry you were offended. And most times I offend people and stuff I said, but in your case, I offended you by something I didn't even say. I never said Peter denied Jesus like a little girl. I said Peter denied Jesus to a little girl, which is actually what happened and very, very different than what you heard. Go back and get the podcast. So what she was offended by was not me. She was offended by her own filter. Often you're offended not by what I say, but what you hear I say, and what you hear me say is often different than what I've said, because when it pops into your head, your filter navigates that, and you actually offend yourself. You offend you. You should be angry at you, because it's your filter. I I was preaching on Super Bowl Sunday in Minneapolis a couple of years back, and and I was talking about, I love football. I love American football. I think it's a cool game. I love anything with mindless violence. This is the way I'm wired. I love the Old Testament. I love reading the Old Testament. I'm just like, that is awesome. David cut the head off Goliath. I just love it. David's out there. It's cool to me. I'm thinking that's, and then he takes the head home. I'm not sure there's anything cooler than David taking the head of Goliath home with him. That is, I don't even know what do you do with that. You clean it out, put a plan in it, give it to your mother for Christmas. I'm not sure. But it's all, I love mindless violence. I love the Bible when it says, lay hands on them and see if they recover. I love that. Seems to endorse boxing. It's great. And so I was talking about, I like football and I don't really love baseball. I just, there's nothing, you know, we we have cricket, which is sort of like baseball and Prozac. But, but I, and and I hate cricket. And and so, and, and nine innings and a point, one run after nine innings, that's a long time to wait for a score. And I remember somebody once saying to me, well, you don't understand baseball. Baseball's all about the statistics and the math. I gotta be honest with you, that didn't make it any more interesting to me. (laughs) I didn't like it when they mixed up math and English and gave us algebra. I do not want math and sport combined together. Separate them, keep math away, leave it on its own, and leave the Sudoku puzzle lovers for it, but Lee, anyway, and so... So I was talking about how, how I, I, I think I can make baseball more exciting by making it harder for the fielder to get the ball because it just seems too easy. He's out there waiting. Oh, there is one. Grabs it with his glove. So I said, wouldn't it be cool, not all the time, but just every now and then, if, if the coach in the dugout could just release some pit bulls to chase the ball down. Batter hits it, clock. Coach, boom, hits his button, Pooh, pit bulls start chasing the ball down. Now the fielder's out there trying to dodge the, the pit bulls and then maybe set them, what would be worse than pit bulls on fire? Flaming pit bulls coming at the guy trying to field. How awesome would that be? And so anyway, this lady writes me an email, angry at my cruelty to the pit bulls. She was angry, she's gonna report me to Peter for my cruelty to the pit bulls. And so we looked on Facebook and checked out her Facebook page. She's a dog lover. 
Every photo, she was there with some. She was there with like a chihuahua. She's there with a sausage dog. Every, every, every photo that she had, she had all these photos with her with dogs. And she, so all she heard, nothing about, she just about, you heard it. I had to write back and say, oh, ma'am, so sorry. And uh, I just want to let you know that no pit bulls actually were injured in my joke and I didn't have time to tell you this before I set up the joke, but I took time out before I told the joke to dress them all up in fireproof suits. And so none of the dogs were actually burnt or touched in my joke. So her filter, do you understand? So, so, so Jesus is saying when, when, you, when you do get hurt, offended, wounded, or somebody does something even greater, that authority comes when you take authority over the hurt. You don't let the hurt dictate your life. You dictate your own response to the hurt. The hurt that was sent to destroy you. The hurt that was sent to make you disappointed. The hurt that was sent to make you angry. The hurt that was de designed to give you an offense, the hurt that was designed by the devil to put bitterness in your heart. He says, you have authority when you take authority over that what was sent to destroy you. He goes on here in verse 18. He says, assuredly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. That's talking about kingdom authority. I say to you that if two of you agree, if you can get into agreement on earth concerning anything that they ask, it'll be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there in the midst of them. And that leads us to the second leading question. Because Jesus is, Peter is hearing Jesus talking about authority through forgiveness. And so he asks this question. Well, Jesus, how many times should we forgive? Seven times? Now, the rabbis taught then that if you were to be generous with forgiveness, if you were to be like big-minded when it comes to some grace, that you'd give people three shots and you'd forgive them every time before you wouldn't forgive them. So Peter is rolling out a number that he thinks mind-blowing because he's doubled the rabbi's deal and added tax. And I'm pretty sure that this is sort of how Peter saw it in his head going down. He's like, okay, gentlemen, gentlemen, gather. Get over here. Get over, Thomas, get over here. Yeah, I know that you doubt I'm going to say anything good, but get over here anyway. And so gather around, gentlemen, gather around, gather around. Uh, Jesus is talking about authority. And uh, I want you to look and learn how it's done. Just watch me, watch me do my thing. I'm sure you're going to be pretty impressed. So he pops out, hey, Jesus, I'm hearing you talking about you get kingdom authority by forgiving people. And so uh, I'm wondering how many times should we forgive? What is generous forgiveness? I'm going to throw out the number seven. What do you think about that? And he anticipated that Jesus would go, Yea, verily and therefore, Peter. And this is my Jesus voice. And yea, again I say yea. It's going to be horrible if I get to heaven and Jesus does not speak like that. If I get to heaven and Jesus is like, Hello. Who are you? I'm Jesus, King of kings and Lord of lords. Thought you'd have a cooler voice. Yea, verily and therefore, Peter, and yea, again I say yea, I have been talking about forgiveness and being generous in forgiveness, and I was going to throw out the number four, but thou bust out with that huge number seven times. I don't even know how to comprehend such great levels of generosity. Yea, even I, the Lord, would say, that frieth my breath. <laughs> my brain is blown by the hugeness and the intensity of what... No, that's not what Jesus said. Jesus responded with, eh, wrong answer. Why don't we try 70 times 7? Why don't we try unlimited? Why don't we try not putting a stop mark there? And then he said, there was a king who had a servant who owed him 
10,000 talents. He goes into the parable and he, he teaches on this concept of forgiveness and authority meshed in. Jesus would never ask us to do anything he wouldn't do. And when he was on the cross, they threw everything that they could at him. Everything that they could at him. They beat him with their fists. They whipped him within an inch of his life. They put a crown of thorns in his head. They spat on him. They cursed at him. They, they, met, they did everything they could to inflict as much pain. And they crucified him, hang an accusation on him, as much pain as humanly possible to inflict on him. And in that moment, when he was hanging up at the cross, he looked down at all those people that did that to him, and Jesus made these words. He said, Father, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. He could have said, kill them. Kill them now. Kill them bad. Make it hurt. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. He took authority over it. That's what, author that's what forgiveness does. Is it takes authority over those things sent to rob you of your joy, steal you of your peace, and destroy your future. So I want to just give you a couple of thoughts as we close out on the kajillionaire mindset. And it's simply this. Number one, you've got to learn how to receive the promise. You've got to learn how to receive the promise. Jesus didn't go to the cross for his sin. He went to the cross for our sin. And the Bible says that the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all our sin. Everything. Big, medium, small, unimaginable. I don't think God could forgive me. He says, yes, I can. This seems too big, God, for your grace. He says, there's no limit to my grace. I'm not sure that I, you can, no, he says, all, all white, pure, no sin, past, present, future, all the sin. When, when, when the king wrote off the debt, it was huge, but he wrote off all the debt. The servant walked out owing nothing. And I believe if we're ever gonna forgive anybody else, it begins with learning how to forgive ourselves. Because there are too many Christians walking through life repenting of sin that God has no record of in heaven because he's already forgiven you. You're still wrestling over guilt and shame and embarrassment with things you did years ago. And God says, I'm sorry, we've checked the file. There's nothing here. We have no record of that. It's only in your mind. And you've got to get to the point where you learn to forgive yourself. Because it's hard to forgive anybody else unless you can forgive yourself. The Bible says you've got to love your neighbor as you love yourself. And unless you can get some love for you, it's hard to love anybody else. You've got to get to that point where you forgive and forget and move on to to the next thing and stop holding yourself prisoner to your past. It's time to get your back straight, your shoulders back, your head up and say, I am a son. I am a daughter of God. I'm a child of God. I am clean. I am pure. I am holy, not because of my righteousness, but because of the righteousness of Jesus Christ. But you are righteous and you are holy. Each week we receive calls from all over Ohio, places like Cleveland, Toledo, Columbus, Mansfield, and Akron, just to name a few. We hear stories about renewed relationships with Christ, hope restored, and people being refreshed by the message. Help StorySide help Ohio. Help us transform lives in your community. You can do this by giving financially to this ministry, by logging on to StorySideChurch.com, by downloading the app, which is free on the Apple and Android devices, or you can text the number on the screen to give. Remember, we can't buy our way into heaven, but we can help someone else get there.